What are some of the dangerous existential threats facing our nation today? And what and who are the forces behind them? What sorts of ideopathogens are infecting our young? And how did a racial hoax forged in the crucible of identity politics supersede facts, reason, and logic? Are our universities national security threats and our professors enemies of the state? And on the existential personal front, how should we configure and live our lives in the face of death? These are some of the questions I and my next guest will explore. This is The Jason Hill Show, and I am Jason Hill. My guest today is David Horowitz, the founder and president of the David Horowitz Freedom Center and editor of the center's online front page magazine. David is a legend and an icon in the world of conservative political thought and is also a social and existential existential philosopher. He is the author of over 59 books, including mega bestsellers such as Big Agenda, President Trump's Plan to Save America, Dark Agenda, The War to Destroy Christian America, Blitz, Trump will smash the left and win, The Enemy Within, How a Totalitarian Movement is Destroying America, I Can't Breathe, How a Racial Hoax is killing America. And other very, very interesting books such as Unholy Alliance, Radical Islam American and the America, American Left, The Professors, The 101 Most Dangerous Academics in America, One Party Classroom, How Radical Professors at America's Top college, Colleges Indoctrinate Students and Undermine Our Democracy, and the conservative classic Radical Son, A Generational Odyssey, which among other things tells a story of David's startling political odyssey from a 60s radical to a 90s conservative. David, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me, Jason. David, I'd like to begin with your book, The Enemy Within, How a Totalitarian Movement is Destroying America. Uh, you identify it as a radical ideology that is rooted in identity politics, that is a racial and collectivist, that is racial and collectivist actually, and that privileges groups over individuals and demonizes those who fall on the wrong side of the equation. David, can you tell us which groups in your mind fall into this category and which you consider the greatest existential threats to a republic? The greatest existential threat to America, bar none, is anti-white racism of the left. Uh, it's a perfect ideological f formula uh, for destroying a country. Um, race, the, you know, there's aspects of the new anti-white racism which are exactly parallel to the racism of the Ku Klux Klan and the, and the Nazi party. Uh, but there's great differences as well. Uh, Ilan Omar, uh, who is, uh, it's hard to describe Ilan Omar. I mean, it's unbelievable the low level that we have come to in this country in our elected representatives. Uh, but Ilan Omar, who's a leader, she's a Jew hater, she hates America, she identifies herself, she has like 10 self-identifications, none of which is American, and refers to herself as a foreigner. She comes from a family um, that was part of the ruling class in Somalia. Uh, her father and grandfather worked for the government her father was a propagandist for Siad Bar, the Stalinist dictator, uh, who, who basically turned Somalia into a Soviet satellite and whose human rights record is so bad. I mean, the UN, which is hardly a conservative institution, um, said it was the worst human rights abuses in Africa, which is saying something. 
they killed 50 or 60,000 people in one year. Um, and she poses as a victim. She's this poor black and immigrant, second class citizen victim of white oppression. Um, the formula is, is very simple. Uh, everybody who's not a white male is a victim uh, and therefore can't be held accountable for their deeds, their achievements, or lack of achievements. Um, uh, and everybody who's white, well, white males are oppressors. So you, you come with this magic shield if you're Ilhan Omar or any of these America-hating radicals um, that protects you from any kind of scrutiny. I mean, she lied to get into the country. Um, she's, uh, um, she had an incestuous marriage with her brother to get her in. Her father lied by, by not telling the immigration authorities that he was a communist. Uh, which violates the 1965, the McCarran Act, I believe. Um, she can do anything and uh, pose as a victim and therefore somebody you should champ champion in the name of social justice. Uh, while everything is blamed on, on uh, white power structure, white supremacy, these are idiotic terms in terms of America. Um, that, how idiotic well these people call the constitution of the United States a white supremacist document even though it, the words white and black or male and female don't even appear in the constitution it's a perfect uh, egalitarian document um, but they call it white supremacists because they hate America and want to destroy it these are all communists. That's their agenda. Um, they talk about reimagining things, which is perfect. It is a fantasy. The socialist idea is a total fantasy. It can never work. Uh, it always runs into the problem that people don't like to be orchestrated and ordered around by the state. Uh, so they have to kill a lot of people when they get into power, but they never achieve anything. The Soviet Union just produced continental poverty and s stole a lot of technologies from the United States, which makes it a military power. But uh, you probably haven't bought anything Russian recently except vodka because um, it's got a third world economy still, despite whatever it is, 100 years of socialism. David, the, the, one of the rejoinders I hear from the left is that there are white supremacist groups and there then there's Black Lives Matter. Yeah, but they're minuscule compared to the black they're supremacist minuscule. groups. Right. The, the, right. There's right. A, you know, black racism is out of control and nobody mentions it. But, you, you, you know, there are uh, black racists going around shooting people in the streets just murdering them. One of the reasons they murder cops. Um, and, you know, beating the crap out of eight, little old Asian women, 80-year-old Asians, you see it all the time, cold cocking them in subways. Why, why is it their <coughs> outrage over that black racism? Um, because blacks are a protected group in America. Uh, the idea that blacks are marginalized is idiotic. No, who believes that? Blacks have been the center of attention since the Civil Rights Act of the 60s um, and underserved. Who believes that? Blacks are privileged. They have most of the privileges. You want to get into Harvard, even if you're an idiot like um, Jean-Pierre, what's her name? I can't can't remember, something Jean-Pierre, um, the presidential spokesperson. She's a moron, but she graduated from Harvard. This is Joanne Reed, a, a rank racist, not very bright. 
also. Uh, and Ellie Mistal, who's a joke. I mean, these are garbage mines. This is the lowest level. I mean, we have very brilliant black people in this country who've come to the fore in the last 20 and 30 years since the Civil Rights Act really had teeth. Absolutely, you know, brilliant people. I'm talking to one of them now. Um, but they're not the ones that the Democrats want to put front and center because if, if you're an intelligent person, you see that America is God's gift to black people. Um, they all, every black in America who has ancestors who were slaves is free today because of the sacrifices of white people, which are never recognized. <coughs> there are 360,000 whites, mainly whites, that were black soldiers, obviously. It's a beautiful film about that. Um, uh, but they're mainly whites of the 360,000 who gave their lives. In the history of the world, there's not another case of one race making such a sacrifice to free another race. And all those blacks were enslaved by other blacks in Africa and sold at slave auctions. So the left is operating and it can, uh, under this mythology um, that we live in a white supremacist country that oppresses black people, or it is it liberated black people. There's no country in the world that gives black people as much rights, as much equal rights, privileges, and opportunity as America. And that includes all of black Africa and the West Indies. Where's the recognition of that? So these people are operating in an alternate universe whose only reason for being is to destroy this great country uh, and what it has achieved in the way of freedom and equality, tolerance and inclusion. Well, David, you know that I have gotten into a lot of trouble for saying that based on the, like you, you know, based on this. With so armed guards, I understand. Yeah, they're fascists is what they are. Nazis would be, it's too inflammatory, but that's technically the proper term for the woke left is Nazis. They're racist and they're communists. Well, as I was saying, based on the, um, you know, I've gotten in trouble for saying based on the sort of race-based privilege and the benefactions that blacks have received, um, that today they are, well, call them sort of sacred, sacred icons. That is, I, I worked in the, as a professor for 25 years, in, as a, a professor in the, in the academy, and I can tell you that if you are a black male, who are the, they're considered endangered species, and you have a C plus or B minus average, there's no progressive liberal school that will not send a jet plane and recruit you well, uh, for basically terrible. being a. This is such being, contempt for black people. Yeah. That's, yeah. That's, that's all it is. They make themselves feel good, but they. They're the chief enemy of black people. There's all these incredibly, incredible quality individuals. Of course, you know, there's that older generation of Tom Sowell and Walter Williams. But now there's so many young, brilliant blacks. Um, you know, I'm getting old, so I don't have a great memory for names. But um, I think he's the... Lieutenant Governor in Kentucky is a very articulate Cameron is his name, and there's a wonderful black DA in uh, Louisville, uh, and uh, I, I really shouldn't go on this way because names are the greatest challenge that old people have. Uh, but anybody can see it, when, you know, when they're in public. Or Carol Swain. Um, there's just no contest. I mean, the only way Joy Reid could win an argument is by talking over her so-called guest uh, and distorting everything they say and, and uh, deflecting attention from her agendas. Well, David, I, I want to ask you this question um, because you've, you've you've already answered one of the questions I was going to ask you, which is what does America get wrong about race? But I, as a as, as someone who as you're a historian and a chronicler of of much of what 
we're talking about here, I want to ask you at what point in American America's history did victimology, which seems like a very un-American trait, at what point did it become not only just a financial cottage industry, but now seems to be part of the, the narrative of what it means to be unauthentic if one is, say, a black or a woman or a well, gay or Islamic? Well, back. I, it gives me an opportunity to explain. Um, there was not, America was not only not a white supremacist country in its founding, uh, but through its history until about 1840. And the, the first, as I said, slavery was an African institution. And, you know, a white um, slave trader, so you wanted to make money, just bought into an African institution, slavery, until um, the, the Declaration of Independence and the founding when a movement was born among white Christians, it's very, very important that they were Christians, um, to free the slaves. So the slave owner's response was in that, this would be in the 1820s, was to develop a racist attitude. That is, they, they were patriots in the sense that they, believed in the Constitution and the founding. Of course, many of the founding fathers were slave owners from the South, um, which didn't doesn't prevent them from being responsible for black freedom. Um, like Thomas Jefferson, every, every black in America was a debt to Thomas Jefferson for writing that all men are created equal in America's birth certificate. But that was a challenge to Southern slave owners um, how could they be patriotic with that sentence and uh, uh, commitment in the country's birth uh, certificate, as it were? And their response was to say that that was wrong, that blacks weren't equal. That's, that's where anti-black racism came from, from the Southern slave owners, because it was a big freedom movement in the South. Uh, anti-slavery movement. And of course, it was successful in the Civil War at, at great, great cost in human life. And, uh, you know, the, the repara- you know, I really started my writings about um, Black America uh, with the reparations controversy back at the turn of the, the century. We're back with David Horowitz and David, you were talking about the, the reparations movement and your and your writing. Well, victim, victim, it's the white white slave. Well, I shouldn't just say white slaveholders because there were three thousand black slaveholders, and there were Indian slaveholders, but the slave owning class developed the, the first most important victimology movement, um, saying that you know, the. Declaration of Independence had maligned them by saying that blacks were equal. <laughs> they were they were the victims of that kind of oppression. But it, it works. You, you have to understand. There's two things going on here. There's the racism. The racism is instrumental. Um, I, I don't think I finished that thought about the difference between Ku Klux Klan racism and the equally bigoted, um, demonizing racism of Ilhan Omar. And the difference is that Ilhan Omar is married to a white, well, this is her current husband, is a white man. You can't imagine um, a couple composed of a Klan member and a black person in the, in the years of segregation and when the Klan was riding high. Um, and the difference is it's, it's ideological, um, the new racism. And it's designed to divide 
the world into oppressors, white males, and oppressed. And they don't even believe that um, seriously. They don't have any problem with this dementia case who's in the White House and is just wreaking havoc among hundreds of thousands of brown-skinned and black-skinned migrants. The death toll at the border is enormous. The rape toll. And, and Biden couldn't care less. And neither could all the blacks around him. Because they're picked, because they went to Harvard where they learned all this leftist nonsense. Well, you mentioned Harvard. So I, I, I want to move a little bit into the universities, which you've written long before people were people such as myself were talking about defunding universities, David, you were writing about this in, in your books on the professors. Uh, so I must say you were among the first decades ago in your books on the radical professors to identify the universities as what I would call national security threats. And things seem to have gotten much worse. So I'd like to hear, how would you describe the state of the universities today and the, and the professoriate? Oh, if they were shut down, we would raise the intellectual level of the country. Okay. Harvard is a disgrace. It's just a disgrace. Anybody who goes to Harvard has to prove to me that, um, first of all, that they have moral standards, and second of all, that they are haven't just been brainwashed into this nonsense. It's so anti-American. It's so destructive. You send your kid to Harvard, you risk losing them. Um, I would defund all the liberal arts colleges until they have faculties that look like America has that. <laughs> they, they, they have faculties which contribute 95 to 1 monies to Democrats and Republicans. 95 to 1. So they're one-party states. I actually wrote a book called The One-Party Classroom. That's not an educational institution. Uh, and, and when the, the lone dissenter has to be protected by armed guards. That's, that's, not a, that's not an educational institution that taxpayers should be funding. I, I believe the solution is to voucherize all education from, for all races uh, and ethnicities from, and classes from kindergarten through, uh, through graduate school. But, you know, David, some of these is I was I've been keeping up with what's going on in K through twelve, and I've also been keeping up with what's going on with the private schools. And some of the private schools are becoming, I mean, just as woke. I mean, they're the problem worse. with these where I spoken at private schools, they're worse. They're worse. Why do you think this is the case? I don't know. It's, it seems that the country is now divided between the working classes and the middle class, mm -hmm. and the arts and croissant elites uh, on on the coast. They're very rich people. They, it, it's costless to them. I mean, the, it will be a cost when the revolution comes. Uh, but, you know, if they're rich and they toe the party line, they'll do very well under communism. It's the rest of the people that suffer. So if the private schools, David, are just as bad, and I agree with you, because they're just as woke, and they're just as uh, interested in, you know, degendering their children or ungendering their children or spreading this sort of vitriol um, in terms of identity politics. What do we, how does, so well, what unbelievable. is, you, if you were talking about Nazi Germany, it would make sense. But you're talking about what's happening in America, this genital mutilation of kids behind their parents' backs. That is so, we are, in dire circumstances in this country, we may not have a country in a couple of years. I, I my, a book that I wrote last year, but that won't, because of supply chain issues, won't be out till January. Uh, it's called the final battle. The next election could be the last. That's where we're at. We're in the early stages of a police state. What do we do in the interim? I mean, do you agree with something like what Ron DeSantis is doing in, in, in Florida? Is that sort I think of... Ron DeSantis is terrific. I'm, I, I'm, I suffer a little because 
he was, at, you know, I do this restoration. In terms of re restoration. Stymieing, stymieing what's going on, like even in the private schools. I'm sorry. Well, in terms, if the, my question is, if, if if the private schools are just as horrific in terms of their woke supremacist ideologies permeating the curricula, what what what? If, if it's a government school, it's one thing. But what what do we do as a culture? What does political? How does political leadership respond? Well, that's vouchers. You give the dollar in the hands of the parents. Look, look, the the amount of money I, you know, I used to do this kind of K twelve work. Uh, and I, well, I recall figures like, say, the D.C. schools, the Washington, D.C. schools, which are terrible. <coughs> uh, uh, the, the cost, the per pupil cost in a, in a public school is like $30,000. So <laughs> when you consider that, so you have, you have um, 10 kids in the class, you've got three hundred thousand dollars right there. You mean you can't hire a K twelve teacher for a hundred thousand dollars and and use the other money? Um, well, you could you could use a church. Every you know every black church in America could be a school, just as an example. Every church could be a school, um, and it would give the parents enough power to do something. Right now, they have to deal with these school boards. They, they, you know, they have the teacher unions. Shouldn't the teacher unions are the worst enemy of these children? They don't give a damn about the kids. It's just it's it's unreal. But I was going to say about DeSantis. Um, I have this restoration weekend, which I do every year, and uh, Ron DeSantis. Oh was one of our featured speakers at four of them. Uh, and uh, I gave a speech for an, uh, a bi it was actually a bi it was a conservative, but it had bipartisan support organization uh, and bemoaned the weakness of Republicans because uh, they, you know, Black Lives Matter was in control of curriculums in California uh, and the Muslim Brotherhood through CARE um, as well. And I said, why aren't Republicans doing something about this? So the left took after me and called me a racist. And I, I had two sentences referring to this, and that, that's all I basically said. Um, of course, the... Uh, Black, the left conflates it. Black Lives Matter does not speak for the black community, but the left pretends that it does. So that made me a racist for criticizing them. That happened in August 2018, and DeSantis was running for the governorship of Florida, and the race got started to get hot in September. And the Democrats were trying to portray him as a racist, so they used me, that hung me around his neck, and said that he had spoken four times for an infamous racist. I think that was the Huffington Post headline. Um, and, and that made it impossible for me to, I couldn't work with DeSantis after that because I was such a liability. It, it's very effective, the left's, um, uh, left's attacks on on conservatives and their smears, as you can see with Trump. You know, Trump Trump would have been president in twenty twenty if it weren't for these kinds of attacks. Well, David, part of why you get called racist is, I, and I want to turn to to, to your book, um, "I Can't Breathe: How a Racial Hoax Is Killing America." Is that you know, I, I did a review of that book, as you know, for Front Page Magazine, and um, at first I was a little bit skeptical by the title, and then I got into the book, and I was again just sort of blown away by the unsentimental, statistical, factual, judicial um, way in which you researched the book. 
So I, I want to read just a little bit from um, some of the book and some of the re my review, basically, and 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 to and a, a point to the fact of why you might be called a racist. Every year, more than 10 million arrests are made by police departments nationally. In 2019, 14 unarmed blacks and 25 unarmed whites were killed by police. A 2001 Justice Department report stated that when quote, a white officer kills a felon, that felon is usually a white. And when a black officer kills a felon, that felon is usually white. And that nothing has changed in the year since then. A 2011 Bureau of Justice statistics showed that of all the suspects killed by police from 2003 to 2009, 41.7% were white and 31.7% were black. In this period, blacks accounted for 38.5% of all arrests for violent crimes. That is the type of crime most likely to trigger potentially deadly confrontation with police. And you, you go on to debunk a lot of the shibboleths surrounding, um, you know, police brutality vis-a-vis -vis blacks. And I, I guess one of the questions I wanted to ask you is that in spite of all these facts that you marshal, why is there still such pushback against, in the public imaginary, against the facts? Well, there's, we, we've lost... There's only one side to the public conversation, basically. You know, um, the audiences for racist uh, channels, A ABC, CBS, NBC, MSNBC, CNN, and so forth, uh, way outnumber uh, the audiences for Fox and uh, OAN and, and Newsmax. People just don't know. There is no systemic race. You have the president of the United States saying that systemic racism affects every facet of American life. It's a monstrous lie, and it's easily disproved. Uh, the Civil Rights Act of 1964 specifically outlaws in s systemic racism. If there are 18,000 police departments. If there were some systemic racism in one or 10 or 100, there would be a tsunami of lawsuits. Every prosecutor, every Soros prosecutor in the country, and probably every prosecutor would be prosecuting these police departments and collecting huge damages. There are no such suits because there is no systemic racism. It's a lie. But people are scared. Uh, you know, they don't want, they don't want to be tarred and feathered like you and me. <laughs> That's the biggest problem. So people yes. are intimidated from saying the truth. Yes, yes. Well, you know, I'm, I agree with you. I mean, I've argued in my book that uh, since the 1964 Civil Rights Act, which not only made racism uh, illegal, but was a form of giving the attendant affirmative action programs, was a form of reparations, that we live in what I call a post-oppressive post -oppressive society. Um, and uh, there, you know, you see the sort of pushback that one gets from that, from that sort of thing. But um, the other, the other thing that interests me about about how you are sort of treated in the in the media is um, that you, again, long before even nine one one, David, you were out there on the front lines talking about the threat of the Islamization of. America and the threat of the radical yeah, Islam. All, all these Islamic, the Muslim Brotherhood, um, which is, you know, that that's how Islam, Osama bin Laden became a jihadist <laughs> through the Muslim Brotherhood, uh, which is dedicated to a global Islamic dictatorship. Uh, um, there are no Islamic dis democracies. Um, I, did a, I did this book on Holy Alliance, but if they do the same thing the left does. They pretend that they represent all Muslims. They, are, they represent far too many Muslims. The Al Jazeera did a survey after 9-11 and found um, that a third of Muslims globally supported, thought Osama bin Laden was a great hero and support the jihad. 
Well, a third of the Muslim world is 500 million people. So that's a sizable constituency for terror, isn't it? Um, but it, it, if you listen to Ilhan Omar and other jihadists, she, I mean, she's part of the terror network. You, terror is violence in the service of political ends. It always has to have a political arm. The IRA in Ireland had Sinn Féin was the political party. And the, um, the, <laughs> the squad is the, polit- is the political party uh, of the Islamic jihadists, the terrorists. We're back with uh, David Horowitz. I'm Jason Hill. David, um, I wanted to turn to a part of you, and then we can go back to some of the other stuff we're talking about. But I wanted to turn to a part of you that um, you're 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 a very interesting, fascinating man. In that you're a, you're the, the world. Some of the world knows you as this sort of firebrand political, um, <laughs> I don't know what to call you, a firebrand political conservative warrior. Oh, <laughs> but, <laughs> but you're also, you're also um, speaking as, a, as an academic philosopher, I'm proud to say that I also regard you as, as a philosopher. You're an existentialist, moral, social philosopher. I did a review of your book that, uh, um, uh, that, uh, that, that just came out actually, um, uh, today, um, well, it, it it came out on the on the twenty fourth of of um, of August. It's called Mora- "Mortality and Faith: Reflection on a Journey Through Time." Um, and I know it's a compilation of some of your other works um, that you've done. Um, yeah, you're, but... talk- you're talking about what is for me the the favorite part of me. Those two two books. Um, Radical Son and Mortality and Faith, which have philosophical dimensions. Um, also, I did a book about my daughter who died from a congenital disease when she was in her 40s called The Cracking of the Heart. And and it's my favorite. I, I, I had the best time writing those books. And I really read my work when I do. They're my favorite books. They also include um, other books that you've written called The End of Time, A Point in Time, You're Going to Be Dead. Those are all included. First, I quoted them as separate volumes. Yes. But but my image is a a political firebrand. I mean, that's all that the conservatives kind of wanted at the time. I, I, of course... Uh, until um, 1975, um, I, I was my my co-author and I, Peter Collier, were celebrated authors um, in the literary world. Uh, I I, uh, I can't remember that we we were called the classic. Chroniclers of American Dynasties or something like that. Then we had the uh, really poor judgment to write a um, Washington Post cover story for their magazine, which they called Lefties for Reagan, where we admitted we had voted for Reagan, much to our surprise. And that was the end of our literary careers. When I- I don't exist as far as these, uh, the, as the literary culture is concerned. Well, you made your comeback and you made it in a big way. Um, I was struck by, in reading Mortality and Faith, uh, I was really, really struck by the dignity in which you sort of held yourself through all your 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 illnesses as, as it came across the page. And, and really more uh, by your deep and enduring love that you and your wife, April, have for each other. 
Um, I don't know if you want to share a little bit about that love that you have and how you sustain each other. And my wife has been a great blessing to me. Um, yeah, I, I, I had some hard knocks physically. Well, actually, I was very healthy till I was 60. It's a funny thing. You, in modern medicine keeps you alive, but then you you fall victim to all the old age problems. Um, but I, I, I've always sort of tried to take this in stride and not let it interfere with my life. But I was very blessed to have met my wife on a blind date, actually. Um, and she's made my last... 30 years of joy. Uh, I write about it in uh, Immortality and Faith. You do. How, how we met. Um, I, I think I, I conveyed how, how our relationship works. It's very, people underestimate how difficult it is um, living with another, per just living with another person. People are very different. They have different reactions to things. And uh, if you take it, the conflicts too personally, you can destroy a relationship. And of course, trust is a huge issue. And I, I think I wrote, I can't remember, oh, it must have been in Mortality and Faith about how my wife, she had a son when I met her. Uh, and she hid that fact from me through the first three months of our relationship. And she was very nervous in revealing the secret she had kept. But to me, it showed she was protecting her son. And I said, it, but a person who loves that way is somebody that, that I want to be with. And because uh, she will protect me. And that's sort of how it worked out. You just have to work on your in, impatient shortcomings. Um, you know, they're always saying communication is important. We're sure it is. But also, it's keeping the trust. If you don't have trust, you don't really have a relationship. Or you have a relationship that you can't depend on. And what struck me in that, in that paragraph, or in that section, was that if she was willing to protect that aspect of her love for her son, she was also willing to protect the love that she had for you. Yes. Yes, yes. Um, I was also very, very struck by the sense in which you are aware that each of us is in some sense quite helpless to change the world in the manner in which we sort of imagine that we can change the world. I mean, in a sort yeah, of, the, not an apocalyptic, but in this sort of... evils of certainly of my lifetime, Yes. Uh, but I would say the, the greatest evils of the last century have been people who think they can make the world a better place. The, the world is doomed to be what it is. It's been this way. You have to think of it this way. When, when I went to uh, college, I, I went to Columbia University, and the first book we had to read was the Iliad which was written in whatever, 1200, wasn't written, it was sung in 1200 BC. And in order for us to relate to the people in the Iliad, it showed that people haven't changed in 3,000 years. And that people are the problem. The problem is not races, it's not patriarchies, it's not uh, whatever. No, none of these abstraction classes. It's individuals that we all. You actually quoted one of my favorite passages that the, uh, from the book of Mortality and Faith is that we, in every generation, we all six billion of us create the world, and so it has all of our faults. Uh, and, you know, life is pretty short. You don't really live, you, you get to the end when you can probably, you know, what you can do is pretty limited. 
um, it's too late to, ch to change everything or to change things around you. Um, so we're, we, you have to be very careful when you're changing the world because the problems of the world are created by individuals who lie, cheat, steal, um, and so forth, covet, all the things that are forbidden in the Ten Commandments. Um, but the people that you empower, like the Ilan Omars, to change the world are, are much worse because they have power um, and they're intoxicated with their own sense of superiority. Uh, I mean, think of what it takes. Uh, you know, I, I, it's hard to believe that Joe Biden is running the country, but, you know, think of the people around him like Susan Rice and Ron Klain, who probably are calling the shots. What does it take um, to destroy the southern border, allow terrorists, drug traffickers, sex traffickers, common criminals, rapists to come into the country and fentanyl? Imagine all the deaths these people have caused. What made them so arrogant? Just take this in stride. And it's, it's got to be that they think that they're changing the world to make it better. You know, there's incompetence as well and stupidity. And there's more stupidity than I've ever seen in public life these days. I shouldn't have picked on, uh, on uh, Jean-Pierre. Um, but, she, you know, she's a, she's a perfect press secretary for Biden because she doesn't make any sense. She doesn't understand what she's talking about. She's, she's perfect for a dementia patient to be his shield. Um, but you have all these people pontificating, reimagining. You can't imagine the future. It's a fantasy. So, you know, it's when the Soviet Union fell and they had killed like 40 or 50 million people in peacetime and bankrupted a whole continent, uh, un, the most oppressive regime in human history, the left didn't stop for two seconds to figure out what had happened to their noble progressive dreams because the whole progressive left supported the Soviet Union. How could they have done this? Uh, you know, I spent about seven years trying to figure things out, figure out where we went wrong. One of the things I realized was that the left... Never, being a leftist means you never have to say you're sorry. You just ignore or rewrite the past. The left still thinks that the Rosenbergs were innocent. I don't know how many in your audience will know who the Rosenbergs are, but they were atomic spies um, for the Russians, thinking they were making the world a better place by supporting this monster regime. Uh, but the, the, the left didn't stop, you know, What's their plan? It's what, my favorite song of the 60s, in some sense, at least for the words, is the Beatles song. You know, you say you want a revolution, we don't like to see your plan. There is no plan. Certainly not one that depends on human nature as it exists. But I would like to think that David Horowitz wants to see through his work although not, you're not a dogmatist and you're not a, a revolutionary as the leftists are. But I would like to think, David, that you, through your work, you are working for a better world and you're working to change the world in some way. So well, what, what is the difference between you? Your... Know, there's nothing new about the dilemmas we face. You go back to Candide. Candide is Voltaire's saga of... Uh, an individual in quest of a better world. And the moral of Candide at the end is 
tend your own garden. You can affect the world by affecting the people around you. Um, the more power you have over the more people, the less likely you are to do something beneficial, although individuals can do that. Uh, yeah, I, I wouldn't have written all these books if I wasn't trying to help create a better environment for human beings to grow up in and, and, and act in. But things have gotten much worse over my lifetime, infinitely worse. Things were so much better in the 50s, aside from the race issue. Um, and the race issue, when you think of what it takes to change any institution, let alone a whole society, uh, you know, the, the, um, the left likes to smear America by talking about 400 years of slavery, which is another big lie. There was about 87 years of slavery from the Declaration of Independence to the Emancipation Proclamation. Um, that's a pretty short time. That, that's, in those days, it was probably well, a little over a generation, maybe a generation and a half. That was pretty swift. It takes forever to change people's minds. And, and you know, America had reached this point b before, before the Biden presidency, before Black Lives Matter, had reached the point of... Where, well, just to take one index, uh, anthropologists look at interracial marriage, the approval and disapproval for it, as an index of how tolerant a society is. And uh, I, I believe it was in 1958, it was over 90% of people, including blacks, were against interracial marriage. And by... I, I don't remember the year, but like 1990 or 2000, it was only 4%. That's amazing. And you can see it in our society. I mean, America has never been more multiracial. Um, I'm talking about marriages and families, and not to mention every TV ad. I mean, you know, most, uh, as was explained to me a long time ago, uh, when I was forming my center and doing my books, TV is reality. That, that's what most people relate to. And you see these incredibly integrated families uh, on TV. Uh, and of course, uh, for all professions and so forth and so on. You, you couldn't wish for it better than that. Mm -hmm. I actually wrote about, you know, you saw it coming. I remember, um, you know, sports obviously is a big part of our culture. And uh, the, um, oh, dang, the Detroit Pistons were playing in the championships against the Tr Portland Tra Trailblazers. And there were actually no... No blacks in the audience at that time for NBA games, or very few, not because they were excluded. It just, uh, for some reason, maybe the, I, I, I hate using the thing that tickets were too expensive because 80% of black people live above the poverty line. Um, it, it, it's it's a, an insult to the black community to conflate them with the inner city. Um, but anyway, all these fans came, uh, the white fans of the Portland Trail Bases, they came to boo Bill Lambeer, who was the one white guy on the Detroit Pistons team, because he was the heavy, he played the heavy, that was his role. He was very physical and trying to be nasty and get inside people's heads. But all these white people came and they had a, a team that was all black except for Bill Lambeer. And they came to boo him. Um, and, of course, they all liked Isaiah Thomas because he had that kind of personality. I mean, what more can you ask for than that? 
Well, we certainly, yeah, we have seen, I mean, I have lived in this country for 37 years and I have seen the market and I lived in, I lived in the deep south for eight of those years and I have taught in five different universities from the deep south, the deep rural cornfields of Indiana. And I have seen the market re relation, improve relations and race relations in this country. Um, but before we go, David, I wanted to, to ask you one last question and that is, you know, when, when you go, you will, you will leave a rich literary body of work. And, uh, you, you know, you're going to leave a legacy, someone who's written at my count, 50 something books, 59 books. Um, I had no idea. Yeah. Well, we, know. you know, I did my research and, um, people don't realize that you, you, you wrote books going back to what is it? 19. 62. Uh, you know, you wrote a book called Student Shakespeare, an Existential View, uh, yeah. <laughs> from Yalta to Vietnam, American Foreign Policy in the Cold War, 1967. And Shakespeare books, a good book too. Yeah, these are great books. People should look them Not up. Political. So you're going to leave a legacy. And, and, and I want to ask you, this is, sounds like a hokey question that people ask, but, but it's one that interests me all the time. You know, what is in your core that has yet to be revealed in your writing that you probably would want people to to remember you by i have a book that i've actually written it's going to have to wait on other books that i've written to get published but it puts together it's called luther's gift uh and the subtitle is how martin luther uh discovered the keys to equality and freedom and why the left, the tribal left wants to destroy him. Um, and it, it's, it's a narrative of American, uh, 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 it's the American narrative told from the way I see it. And it's where I, I got um, those remarks I made about how Racism, slavery became racist. They introduced racism into the country um, when the slave owners were trying to defend their institution against the against the Declaration of Independence. Um, and then I, it has a final chapter of explaining why leftists are totalitarians. There's no way around it. I, I, the motto of my front page mag, which I'm responsible for, is that inside every progressive is a totalitarian screaming to get out. And the reason is very simple. In the, uh, in the, in the religious view of the world, at least the Judeo-Christian one, uh, heaven, paradise, is denied to human beings. They were given a place in paradise, but they, in order to stay, they had to not want to do evil. Well, that's the basic uh, parable. But, but they did want to do evil because uh, the serpent said, if you eat of that tree, you shall be as God. It's the that's the arrogant pride that is mankind's downfall. Um, so if you're a believer in the Judeo-Christian tradition, whether, whether you're a believer or not, but if you see this wisdom, then heaven or paradise or that better world that people are always dreaming of uh, it, it is after death. It's not of this world. Yes. If you're a leftist, you believe you can create the better world. And the way you do it is by converting people to your vision. You have to change human nature. So you have to get everybody has to be politically correct. Everybody has to say and think the right things. And that's the totalitarian model. That, that if you allow dissent, you're endangering this future that can only take place when it, they get enough power through recruiting enough people. 
And that's why the left is always, they lie about everything. It's their second nature to lie. Um, because they, their agendas are so destructive. Well, David, I want to thank you very much for appearing on the show. We're, we're, I'm definitely going to have to have you back several times, especially to talk about, I want to devote one whole episode talking about Radical Son and Generational Odyssey so listeners can hear that amazing journey of yours from being a radical leftist Black Panther supporter to becoming a conservative warrior. That that's a program that that uh, that that is uh, that needs to be heard by our listeners, and and you need to tell that story. I want to thank you again for appearing um, on on the show, and I wish you all the best until we meet again. Uh, this is the Jason Hill Show, and I'm Jason Hill. Thank you, Jason. Jason Hill Show is a project of the David Horowitz Freedom Center and Front Page Magazine. Unauthorized reproduction of this podcast without express written consent is prohibited.